guys ready? I know I am. Let's get into it. Welcome to From Skirts to Scrubs. I'm Charlotte, and Alicia's not here right now, but I promise you she's in this episode, so don't fret. And we are starting part two of episode five on birth control. Now, if you have not listened to part one, then I highly suggest you pause this podcast episode and you go back and listen to part one because otherwise the discussion might be a little confusing if you don't have the context. Speaking of discussion, we are actually going to jump right back in where we left off and we're going to go through the rest of the history, which is just a little bit, and then jump into our discussion as always. And make sure you stay on till the end to hear about our fun Instagram little story time about birth control that we are really excited to have our listeners participate in, as well as Alicia and I. But you'll learn more about that at the end, so let's just get back into things. To remind you where we left off, the birth control pill had just been approved by the FDA in 1960, and there was... A sudden epidemic of women with irregular periods in need of the pill at this time. Uh, (laughs) Because, as we know, the pill is not always used for birth control. mm -hmm. So this was a huge moment for women, and it coincided with second wave feminism, actually. Alicia, do you want to talk any bit about second wave feminism right now? Um, Yeah, I mean, I can give like a brief overview, at least of what I know about second wave feminism. Because you're the woman's studies minor. Not me. So you definitely know more. So I don't know if you want to supplement some of the information. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I guess like in terms of the feminist movement in general, you might think it's this one big movement, which technically it is, but within it, there's waves. And so we can focus on like the first two, but the first one was just straight up suffragettes. So Mm -hmm. it was 18, like 40s to 1920s. And these were just women who wanted the right to vote. And it was mostly white women. There was a lot of underlying racism within that um, because the white women were really not accepting of having like women of color as part of people who could vote. They would actively keep black women from being part of the movement. Just want to point that out because I feel like that's important. Yes. When they were rallying and like having protests, they would literally make black women walk behind them. That's disappointing. I just felt like that was important to mention. It is important to mention. Also, this was when Margaret Sanger like first opened her clinic. So it's like first wave feminism is like, but second wave feminism is when the personal became political. So like when you hear that phrase, like the personal is political, that is from the second wave of feminism. And that was from the 1960s to 1980s. And it was started mostly because Mm -hmm. of this woman named Betty Friedan. I don't know if you know who she is, but she wrote, maybe you know the book, The Feminine Mystique. I have heard of it, It's like a super, yeah. So she wrote The Feminine Mystique. And it was basically this call to like bring all women together and fight against systemic sexism that kept women at home and like kept women unhappy because people were arguing that if women didn't want to stay at home, they were broken. But Betty was basically saying, no, this is not true. Women deserve to be able to work and have autonomy. Mm -hmm. And this is also when birth control and like reproductive rights really came onto the scene. And there's a ton of second wave legislation, like the Equal Pay Act, which was supposed to help decrease the, gender, like, the gender pay gap. Yeah. Um, and then Title IX, of course, Roe v. Wade, and then other Supreme Court cases, which basically led women to access birth control more readily. That's kind of a big idea. Again, I do want to mention, though, that like in terms of women of color, it wasn't super great because the whole point of this second wave movement was so that women could be out of the house and into the workplace. But a lot of women of color were already forced to work for like a long time. They've been working. And so that was a whole issue. And then also women of color, particularly black women have been subjected to horrible experimentation as we know, Mm -hmm. especially gynecological and they had to endure like forced sterilizations. And so reproductive rights 
looked really different for white women and black women because black women were also just fighting for their bodies to stop being used as like vessels of experimentation and like wanted the freedom to right and to just not even be forced to be sterilized like Mm -hmm. that was something that white women were never worrying about all of that was kind of coming together in in the second wave of feminism right I think forced sterilization is like something we will talk about. Yeah, that's like, definitely worth its own yeah. discussion. But yeah, thank you for that deeper explanation. So with the creation of the pill, this was fuel to the fire under the bond of these women fighting for sexual freedoms and just like the freedom to control their own lives. So after multiple Supreme Court cases were fought over many, many years, By 1972, women who were married, unmarried, and even minors were allowed to access the pill. So now women had this chance to control their own body and their own sexuality. It gave them the ability to pursue a career and enter the workforce and have children later on in life. Yes, we love agency. We love autonomy. Yeah. So with that and with second wave feminism and the creation of the pill, since then, the pill has undergone like numerous improvements to combat the negative side effects. Which there definitely still is some, but it's like, way better now. And there are other extremely effective birth control methods, such as the implant, IUD, which were created around the same time, a little bit after the pill. And they're widely used today, along with the pill. But how widely used, you may ask? Well, in 1967, just seven years after the FDA approved the pill, 13 million women were using it. And today, wow. 100 million women use the pill. Wow, that's crazy. That's just the pill alone. That's just the pill, yeah. By 1970, just 10 years later, two-thirds of Catholic women were using contraceptives. Like, <laughs> what? The Catholic Church is what caused this whole problem. And then the fact that Catholic women were like, we're going to use contraceptives. Now they're available, like two thirds a lot. That is a lot. And then between 1988 and 2000, teen pregnancy rates went down 66%. That's so much. And I'm not even surprised no, by not that. At all. But universal birth control has really yet to be achieved. Access to birth control is hard to come by for tons of women today. There are over mm. 222 million women across developing countries that do not have access to birth control. And Even though Obamacare made it law in the U.S. for federal insurance to cover birth control at a $0 copay, there are laws that allow for employers to not provide coverage for birth control due to religious beliefs, which was literally passed by the Supreme Court in the U.S. just last week. So very relevant to today. We did not even plan this episode because of that Supreme Court case. So we planned this episode months ago. Just crazy. And birth control's can get really expensive too and there's like starting to be more programs people selling birth control at lower costs but i don't know what the effectiveness of the those birth controls are and things like that so yeah it's not super accessible but even though all throughout history women and men even have looked for ways to prevent pregnancy women have resorted to extremely dangerous methods such as drinking copper Mm -hmm. and even putting the crocodile poop inside them. Women Mm -hmm. are desperate to find ways to avoid pregnancy, honestly, not only because it gave them the chance to have a life outside of motherhood, but it gave them the the ability to plan a family that they could actually afford and take care of themselves with. Now in 2020, we have numerous safe and effective methods of birth control, like the pill, which is truly ingenious. And today, 99% of sexually active women have used some type of birth control at some point in their lives. So there is that one person who hasn't for whatever reason. Abstinence. No, but these are sexually (laughs) active women. Oh, (laughs) never mind. (laughs) But uh, yeah, out of 100 sexually active women, 99 would be taking some type of birth control at some point in their life. And the impact that birth control has had on the world is remarkable. Remember how when we're talking about ancient times, that plant had that impact in culture we saw through its presence in theater and in their currency? Well, that is reflected today, honestly, with the birth control pill. So the pill's impact has been seen in the music industry, where the song The Pill by Loretta Lynn is on the Rolling Stones' 100 Greatest Songs of All Time. Wow. Yeah, like there are hundreds 
millions of songs in the world, probably. So much music. And out of the top 100 by one of the most prominent music <laughs> like magazines is about the birth control pill. That's insane. <laughs> Um, another fun fact is that in 1993, the economist named the birth control pill one of the seven wonders of the modern world. And they said, for quote, when the history of the 20th century is written, it may be seen as the first time where men and women were truly partners. Wonderful things come in small packets. Mm. <laughs> That's where I'm going to leave the history. That was great. I love yeah. that. I learned so much. I learned a lot too. And I knew a lot of like the ancient stuff. So I'm glad I learned a lot of the new stuff. And I feel like you knew the most modern stuff and didn't know other stuff. We compliment yeah, each other. Wow. I mean, I still learned a lot of the modern, <laughs> but definitely the ancient, like really did not know any of that. Yeah. The ancient one cracks me up, but all right, let's get into our discussion then. What do you say? Let's okay. do it. My first question to you, Alicia, before we even get to the, like, what did you think question? I really want to know from all the options we went over, what would be your top choice of birth control? (laughs) Okay. I mean, I feel like this wouldn't actually be what I choose, but the one that really stuck with me was Seranus and his holding your breath and sneezing. (laughs) I just thought that was so funny and like so stupid. I have been told I have amazing lung capacity. You are so. <laughs> so I have heard you sing the musicals in the car and you can hit that long note way longer than I can. I mean, you know what? I joined a choir last year and even though it was me and a bunch of 50 year old women, like we sang our hearts out. And honestly, I think I could hold my breath. But no, I think in reality, the one that's like, the most effective is the one that I would use. So the plan that clearly was cash yeah. money to have would be the one that I would Three. use. I don't think of what I would use. Um, I kind of like the pomegranate seeds, honestly. Like those things are yeah. real yummy. I would eat so many of them. So I like that one. Yeah, that'd be fun. Also, I just love Greek mythology. I love that Galen suggested yeah. that, even though he was probably like doesn't really know. work. But honestly, Greek physicians and Roman physicians were good physicians. Like they weren't like good today standards. Right. We were to compare, but for the time, they knew so much for what they had as resources. Mm-hmm. So when you look at their method, you're like, wait, how come you knew so much about the human body and slowly figuring out how it worked, but you couldn't like provide birth control that made sense. It was funny because as you were getting further along in the, of the three, they were getting more and more advanced in their yes. medical <laughs> theories, but less advanced I in their know, birth control. What? So I guess with that, what did you think overall of all the history thoughts you really want to bring up or questions you had, themes you saw or something? I think in general, when I'm thinking about birth control, something that really gets me is we talked about it too, was like separation of church and state, how that really went out the window in medieval times. And I just think it's one of those inherent contradictions. Again, we say, especially in the United Mm -hmm. States, at least, we have this clause in our constitution that's literally saying there is a separation of church and state. And yet Christianity is so ingrained in decisions that occur that are made for us in our daily lives. And I don't know how that isn't unconstitutional, but I'm not a lawyer, so... Obviously, I don't know. I agree. I didn't even talk about this, but there, part of the witch trials had to do with birth control. Like if you were spreading information about birth control and about just like access or any information on it, you were a witch. And those that was cause for you I'm to not be even killed shocked. for being a witch. <laughs> I'm not even surprised. And that's yeah, so upsetting. It's crazy. So the other day, you know this, but no one else knows this. But Alicia was at my apartment the other day, which literally never happens <laughs> for the first time in five months. That is the definition of a 2020 friendship saga. We're never we like wearing our mask and sitting on the balcony and just yep. hanging out for the in first time. At that point. 
So that was really fun. But as we were doing that, we got into this conversation about morals and if morals even really exist, because your morals are what you believe is right. And that can be different from like me to you to me to anyone. So is there really even like true baseline of morals for every human to live by? Or do we all just live in our own bubble of beliefs? And I think this is really important when thinking of birth control history, because women have always sought out birth control, but it wasn't until the Catholic church that it was thought to be immoral and sinful and was even taboo. And like you said, the church is so closely aligned with the state. And it's also so closely aligned with healthcare. We talked about in like the first episode, how nurses were so closely aligned with nuns and especially in medieval times and the ages. So they're controlling the ability to access birth control. So this really made me think about how the morals of the church were applied to women's health and they have a really negative impact. Just got me wondering and what my question is, is what is your opinion on how morals and healthcare look that relationship looks like and how we can be aware of our own beliefs. How do our morals affect our relationships with other people? When I first think about morals, I think who deserves to have a voice in decisions about your health? So is it a religious entity? Is it politicians, your employers? I mean, based on legislation and the Supreme Court rulings about reproductive rights. (laughs) Today, yeah. All of these other voices seem to matter more than Mm -hmm. the patients and like more than their doctor's opinions. They're like a couple of cases, like for example, there was one case that it was Burwell versus Hobby Mm -hmm. Lobby that happened in 2014. So it was like post ACA gets passed. And then immediately where Hobby Lobby is this supply chain company, and they argue that they have religious beliefs that make them uncomfortable with providing birth control coverage to their employees. And so in that case, event, it was like a terrible hit to reproductive rights because Hobby Lobby did win the case. And that set the precedent that honestly is probably what has led to these downstream effects of employers being able to control employees birth Mm -hmm. control access. But cases like that, and then similar cases make me think, okay, Hobby Lobby is a supply chain company. Like a company doesn't have beliefs. A company is this entity. So who is it that's really controlling whose morals are we abiding by in this situation? And it's literally the most high up people in this company who have like all the say over all these women's lives. I think it's like important to point out in case anyone didn't know that like in the US, your insurance is through your employer. If you lose your job, you lose your insurance. So if your job suddenly is like, just kidding, that birth control coverage, no, 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 not for you. That's a big problem. Like so, so, so many women in the US just lost their birth control. Yeah, actually, because I looked it up because I was like, what happened after the ruling? It was- Hobby Lobby. And then in 2018, Trump, his administration stemmed off of that ruling in 2014 to increase the pool of employers who could limit healthcare access. And then again, they quoted, they said religious or moral beliefs. Bringing morals in again. Specifically that. And basically the 2018 ruling like increased that pool of like employers. The most recent ruling did the same, it expanded it even more. So now, The Department of Health and Human Services estimates that this most recent ruling could result in up to 126,000 women losing contraceptive coverage and costing them each like at least $584 a year. Yeah, it's expensive as heck. I mean, I, I know people who stop taking it because of how expensive it is and such. Like most women, I read somewhere that like most women can only afford a copay of like $8 or something. So $584 is actually like more than a lot of people make in and are able to spend. So, and so that's like disproportionately affecting like women of color, low SES women, like these women who don't have access. For sure. I personally do not think that your morals should play into how you treat another person's life. If you have morals, great, live by your own morals, but don't put your morals on someone else. That is their decision to make of how they want to live their life. And so if you don't believe in birth control, like that's fine. You don't have to believe in birth control, but you don't get to decide if I believe in birth control or not. 
absolutely. And if I have the right to it, I think that's where there's a big issue. Also, I do just want to say, just putting this out there, I would love, like someone please explain to me because I truly don't understand how, for example, people can be anti-abortion and anti-birth control. Yes. Someone, please, if you are anti-abortion and anti-birth control, those are your morals. We're not going to step on them, but we would genuinely, I genuinely would love to have a conversation with you. So please like DM us, email us. Like I really want to sit down and actually have a conversation. Really? Like I've never really had a conversation with someone who has like such different views from me about this topic. Yeah. So I would genuinely be interested in sitting down and talking about it. Great. Well, my next question is about another thing I was thinking about while researching and like one article said that the birth control pill was one of the first medications created that wasn't meant for curing a disease, which I thought was super mm-hmm. interesting because even though it wasn't created with the intent to heal someone, it has had a positive impact on women's health. Like that little tiny pill added so much quality of life to women. And this got me thinking and asking myself, and it's my question to you, is like, what is the purpose of medicine and the patient-physician relationship? Is it to cure and prevent illnesses and disease, or is it to improve the quality of life of that patient in whatever way that means for that individual person? Yeah, I think, I feel like with medication, it's tricky because I personally think that in America, we have issues with over medication mm-hmm. because I think we're over medicating patients and it would be a little bit too far to, you know, just give patients the ability to choose whatever medication they want. Right. But I do think though, that a big reason that we are in this over medicating problem is because as a society, we have a major lack of access to preventative care which birth control is preventative care. I should be able to talk to my doctor about it. And really, if I want to be on birth control, then I should be able to push for that to happen for myself. Mm -hmm. Like that should be a personal choice. And I do think it's interesting though, that you said that birth control was the first pill created not to quote unquote cure a disease. Mm -hmm. But I know that And I personally do think also that pregnancy is over-medicalized. The way that like we experience pregnancy and the way that we handle it, especially between like OBs delivering and like midwives delivering is just so, so, so different. And one is more medicalized than the other. And it's because over time, pregnancy has been seen as this kind of disease or thing to cure. Like that's why it's done in a hospital and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And not to say that that's wrong. Like I definitely am a big supporter of hospital births, but I think you could argue that birth control is a way to like cure the disease of pregnancy if you saw it in that way. And I think especially in like forced sterilization situations. In when the pill was created, there was backlash, especially from minority communities it was like um, racial genocide, basically, like through the Mm, pill. mm -hmm. Like you're trying to get us to stop reproducing our race. And that's a valid argument for the time and the environment that people were in. And I mean, we weren't there. We don't know the actual purpose of the pill like within society at that time. But I could see like people being really nervous about birth control, having that purpose as a negative purpose or yeah, as a way to like, stop them from having a children. Like, yeah, I totally agree. And that's just what, that was interesting because the way that that person phrased it is like, oh, this pill is something that can, you know, it, it's not going to cure anything. Mm-hmm. But if you see pregnancy as like this disease, then it is kind of like curing it. And yeah. And I was going to say in terms of is medicine meant to be more reactive, I guess, in terms of like, preventing disease and illness it's usually reactive like you're sick and we give you medication and I think medicine is shifting to be more preventative and um it wasn't like that before I don't think at all 
definitely now, like when I go to the doctor, I'm like, what can I do to not get this illness, this illness, and this illness that I have a family history of? That, those are my first questions before I say, oh, and I'm having this going on too. Like, I want to know right. the preventative steps that I can take to help me have a better quality of life down the line and even just like live a longer life. I'm glad medicine's going in that direction because it wasn't before. It just forms a better relationship with your doctor to be able to go and have a conversation that's so honest and vulnerable of like, I'm nervous about this yeah. part of my life in the future. Can you help me not reach that point? But in terms of talking about, especially like minorities in medicine and with birth control, we usually in this feminist corner talk a lot about how this topic would affect us as women in medicine and women in general. But I thought that this was kind of obvious, really, as we talked about it, and we talked about it a lot in history, but it is still kind of like a privileged healthcare position, especially today, like we talked about how so many women have lost their coverage. So for Mm -hmm. this reason, I want to talk about how can we work to advocate, not just us, but anyone listening, how can we advocate for women of all socioeconomic classes, races, etc. to have access to birth control care or contraceptive care in general. I agree. I think birth control is certainly a human right. Like we all deserve to have access to this. I think this was something I should have talked about in the morals question, but I did forget. But (laughs) it does fit in well here because we're talking about like what you mentioned before about what you want a patient provider relationship to look like, which is something that we in the future will be providing to people. Mm -hmm. And so I think one that's based on trust and like creating this non-judgmental environment in which you feel and your patient can feel like they can come to you and tell you anything and that you're not going to judge them. I know my friends in the past have had really negative experiences, particularly with their women's health physicians, like with their gynecologist. Yeah. I've had multiple friends tell me that they felt judged by their gynecologist, that they didn't feel comfortable being honest with them. Mm -hmm. And that's just not a good way to start off any relationship, especially one with your doctor who's actually there to be a part of your health process. That's such a major issue. And I think something that we can do to combat that and help build relationships of trust is identifying your own biases. For sure. Yeah. And something that I thought of was something that our friend Maggie, who shout out to Maggie. Love you, Maggie. We love Maggie. She, yeah, she's amazing. (laughs) And she had mentioned in this group discussion that I was having that there's like a method that you can remember to help identify your own implicit biases and work on them. So I thought I would share that here because it's really like easy to remember and super useful. Yeah. So they're called the three R's and it's not the the three R's you would think of like reduce, reuse, recycle. (laughs) Okay. Not that. It's, it's not that though. Those are also important. The three R's to identify your unconscious biases are recognition, reflection, and response. Okay. So recognition is the phase that you're just like, okay, I'm recognizing that like, this is a bias that I'm having. So you're identifying feelings when you have a decision to make and you're feeling frustrated or confused and acknowledging that that is something that you are feeling in that moment because of a decision you have to make about someone else's life, Mm -hmm. like about someone's, the care that your patient is in, for example. And then reflection is before you take action on those feelings, reflecting on why whatever is transpiring is affecting you. Mm -hmm. Like if someone is coming to you with like a personal health choice that you don't agree with and you are attributing it to, I don't know, something about like their race, for example. Yeah. Instead of beating yourself over the head about it, thinking about like, okay, I'm having this thought. Like it's making me feel frustrated that they think that. All right. Recognizing that, reflecting like, why do I feel this way? What is it about this person that's making me feel frustrated or angry or like confused about their choice? Okay. So that's the second R. And then the third one is response, which is where you can make a mindful choice about what you're going to do and how you're going to act. That just is a way for you to make a conscious decision Mm -hmm. and like identify your bias and not 
being hard on yourself about it and being like, oh, why did I think that that's so rude of me? Like, I can't believe I did that. Instead of doing that, thinking, okay, here's why I think that. And here's what I'm going to do about it. Because the impact that you make when your action lands is more important than the bias that you have. I agree. And I think I'm glad you went over the steps and it's weirdly relevant because I think it's just in the state of Michigan, but just got passed that all healthcare providers have to go through implicit bias training. I did see that. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, yeah. Adult current physicians have to go through this training to keep their license. I think. Oh, no. Which is interesting and super important because Mm -hmm. you might not even know when you speak to populations who aren't us, who I don't know if we're millennial or Gen Z, we're in the middle, but we either are. way, like millennial and Gen Z are more aware, but if you speak to older generations, they literally don't even know what implicit bias is. So just explaining right. what it is and that it's not a bad thing. It's just something you need to recognize and then work on yourself. And it's mm-hmm. not like it's hard to work on. It's just taking that extra moment to think about it is really important and can impact people positively later. Mm-hmm. And then something I know we want to talk about too with this was that birth control is not just like a reproductive thing, which is absolutely not. super important for advocating for birth control rights because say you are someone working for Hobby Lobby and you're taking birth control because you have the most extreme like period cramps, let's say. They're crippling. Like you are falling to the floor every month because of them and your birth control relieves them to the point where they just feel like normal so that's like a medical issue for that woman and that's why she might take birth control maybe she's not even sexually active that is the reason she takes it and now she just lost coverage and birth control is the only thing helping her with that so now she has to go through these terrible terrible cramps that's just a very small example of how birth control is used for things that are not reproductive we could probably list off so many different ways. We definitely could, but I think what would be more interesting is if we ask you all, our listeners, to give us maybe some of your reasons why you use birth control. You don't have to tell us your names. You can request for it to be completely anonymous if you'd like, but we would love to hear from you. And I guess to make people feel more comfortable with this too is, well, one, we will be posting this episode and then a couple days later on our Instagram posting a question where you can answer this and we can if you want we can share it with people so they feel more comfortable about their own birth control stories and also to raise awareness around the importance of birth control coverage for that reason I do want to share my own story of why I started taking birth control because I started taking birth control from the moment I started my period in middle school because my mom has had ovarian cancer like half my life since I was 10 and I'm 23 now, so for 13 years. And birth control, by taking like the actual pill with the estrogen and progesterone going into your body, has been shown to be effective for ovarian cancer prevention methods. And my mom's doctor told my parents that they were like, we are instantly getting our daughters on birth control when it gets to that time in their lives. So both my sister and I have been on it like way before becoming sexually active And I think that's super important because I was like embarrassed in high school to be taking birth control. Like I didn't want people to know. And it was like Mm -hmm. purely medical preventative reasonings. And like, I still will not switch to a different method of birth control because using the pill is more important to me for the reason of preventative care than for reproductive like purposes, I guess. I think a lot of women share the same stories and like why they take the pill or any birth control can be like very different than what people just assume when they see you grab the packet out of your backpack to take it at the same time every single day. And it's way more important than employers think, than providers think, than government officials. Like it is not just a reproductive type of thing, even though this entire episode has been about the reproductive history of birth control, but that's where it started. So of course that's the history of it. But in modern times today in 2020, there are so many other reasons, which is why advocating for birth control coverage is a woman's health and like women's right issue and not like this little niche issue. Like it's bigger 
than people make it out to be. So we hope that you guys can share your stories with us and we can share it with other people too. Yeah, we would love that. We are just out here educating yeah. ourselves. I also and- wish that you guys could see Alicia as she records. <laughs> Because she does these arm motions where she throws her arms in the air when she's really excited about a topic she's saying. <laughs> it's so true. When my you can also tell when my voice gets really high because I get really into it. It's so funny. <laughs> and with that, we have reached the end of this segment on birth control. And so If you like the content and you want to hear more, you can subscribe on any podcasting app and also rate the podcast and leave a review, which Apple Podcasts is the best place to do that. So we would really appreciate it. Um, You can also follow us on our social media, especially if you want to tell us your birth control stories. Um, Check out our Insta stories, post on there a lot, and we post on social media a ton, especially Instagram, but we have Facebook and Instagram. And you can also check out our website for more information, specifically our show notes and our sources are always there. And that's all from Skirts to Scrubs at from Skirts to Scrubs, from Skirts to Scrubs.com. You can find us there. Hit yeah. Us and for this episode in particular, we're going to have, of course, all our sources, but then also some other sources that we think could be really helpful for you to just like read up on about the recent Supreme Court rulings and like Planned Parenthood and resources you can access in order to educate yourself on birth control and your birth control options if that's something you're interested in looking into. And of course, lastly, we want to give a shout out to all the women who have fought for us to be where we are today because there are so many of them and we love them. And we hope that we may do the same for those who come after us. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next time. Love you. Bye.